is a, I think a better format for the morning. Thank you guys away. Thanks for having me giving the lights down. So, so let's start with number one. Uh, how many of you guys are rotating on pediatric glaucoma already? Often, myself. Anybody? Because I haven't done that yet. Okay. <laughs> so that makes it a little challenging uh, because some of this stuff, I will tell you, you're going to see pretty much almost every type of glaucoma described in the book uh, on that rotation. We're really privileged here at primaries. Uh, it's a tertiary facility, so we get a lot of weird syndromic stuff and we get a lot of the pediatric glaucoma. As well. So let's do number one. We're going to split it up. What do you guys want to name your team? We're playing for pride here. <laughs> Sorry, what's your team? Uh, team one. Team one, okay. <laughs> so, what's your team? Good try. Pride, okay. <laughs> Going out strong with confidence there, okay. So, a number between one and ten. Chris? Seven. 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 Three. Three. They get to go first. Okay, so you guys get to. Uh, it's open. Uh, I'm going to start off the question, and then you guys get to answer in a decent amount of time if you can. Then we're going to switch over to the other team. Okay. Which of the following is not a classic feature of congenital glaucoma? D. D is in dog conjunctival injection. That is correct. So March cornea. You guys remember that. Um, now this goes into another question that we're going to talk about later, I believe. Maybe not. Um, how long, how much time is there, or what age is, what age range do you see corneal enlargement? Like, when does corneal enlargement stop? If you've got high pressure in the eye, you know, you're probably thinking, is every single case of congenital glaucoma going to present with a large corneal? Um, what's kind of your age cut off? Because remember, when the cornea stops stretching. So, usually around. Okay, so between zero and three, the cornea is still very, there's a lot of plasticity in the cornea, and so you're going to see a lot of stretching if the congenital glaucoma occurs during that time. Okay? Uh, now, if it occurs after that, uh, how do we distinguish? Like, there are different types. Congenital would imply that it happens around what age range? Zero to three. <laughs> kind of in that range. Um, or probably more like in the first year. Okay? Uh, but you're going to see that enlargement happen even like, let's say someone's 15 months um, that would still be kind of considered congenital quasi congenital glaucoma and then after that we start calling things infantile okay so infantile is probably you know I, I think if I were let me back up on that definition it's quite better to say that if something presents after a year uh, it would be considered infantile but the ICD-10 code is actually the same it's very similar so whether you call it congenital or infantile I think it just suggests when the patient presented to you but in that zero to three range is when see those classic symptoms. And so let's go through the other symptoms. Hopstria, if you guys remember Hopstria, what is that? Or Hopstria? <coughs> Renee? Hopstria are breaks in decimates membrane. Okay, do they usually, are they vertical or horizontal? They're usually horizontal, sometimes they can be circumferential. Yeah, so it's, we've had a few cases on service recently that have this very serpiginous look. Uh, almost circumferential, they just kind of spiral out. Concentric circles around them. Side of the coin. And so, if you guys see that test question, it happens almost, I think, every other year. You see a test question about hopstria, where they'll tell you about stria on the cornea, these breaks in the cornea, and they'll describe to you that they're either vertical or horizontal. And they're trying to get you to figure out if this is related to glaucoma or not. And the direction is important because usually if it's a forceps injury, it's vertical. Okay, so remember that for your, your OCAPS exams. Uh, vertical stria are usually in, implied. For such injury. Okay, piphora, water in the eye, photophobia, and blood pressure spasm, those are probably the, that's the classic triad, okay, of the piphora, photophobia, and blood pressure spasm. Okay, now this one is open up for anybody, so we're raising your hand first. Which of the following age ranges portends a better prognosis for patients with PCG? Tara, sorry, okay. uh, B. B, 3 to 12 months. That's correct. So, this is very important when you're counseling patients. Uh, there are a minority of cases. I think if your book says 25 or less than 25 percent of cases will present as newborns immediately when you're given birth. As soon as the baby comes out, it's obvious the cornea is cloudy, they have massive loop Um But most of the cases are going to present in that window between birth and year. And so you can tell parents that the prognosis is usually better. They're between three and 12 months. Okay. 
All right, next question. Which of the following are not distinguishing features of axon developed readers? Chris? You said B and C. B and C. So that is partially correct. You are correct, but you didn't. There's one more. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Nobody wants to go for it? Okay. So the answers are which of the following are non distinguishing features? So Chris, you got two out of the three. Autosomal recessive, that is true. That's most cases. I'm sorry, that's false. Sorry. They mostly are autosomal dominant. And, and actually, Chris, I'm sorry, you did, uh, you threw me off there. C is not the correct answer because there are some cases that are sporadic, okay? Yeah. So, B, uh, and then the last one would be D, okay? Those are all not distinguishing features. It is autosomal, <coughs> and it can occasionally be sporadic. So the answers are actually B and D, I'm sorry. I, I'm throwing myself off. These, uh, these not questions are, are meant to kind of probe you yes. to make, make sure you guys know the information. So let me go over this again. axenfeld Riegers, it is bilateral. It's usually autosomal dominant. Occasionally it is sporadic. And the rule of thumb for most of these syndromic problems for general glaucoma is about a 50% risk. So you almost always it's going to be around 50% risk for glaucoma if it's associated with some sort of syndrome. Okay. So posterior embryotoxin, you guys remember what posterior embryotoxin is? Anybody? Yes. Uh, anterior displacement of the Schwalbe's line. Anterior displacement of Schwalbe's line. So you have to look for it in the peripheral point. Can you see it in normal patients? You can. You can. Yeah. Can you see it in normal patients as well? Okay. Uh, and then the last three, F, G, and H, that's a part of what syndrome? It's all lumped together now, I actually felt weaker, but these last three, maxillary hypoplasia, hypospadias, and pituitary abnormalities, have to do with the Rieger's anomaly. Okay? But now it's just all clumped together. So I didn't know that uh, Rieger's anomaly could be uh, associated with pituitary abnormalities. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, it's not something you think about a lot because we're kind of focused on more of the classic ones, the maxillary hypoplasia, things that are obvious. But, uh, in your book, all right, moving on. Okay. Number four, which of the following are not distinguishing features of Peter's anomaly? Chris, you said E. E, that is correct. So, leucoma, do you guys remember what a leucoma is? How many of you guys seen Peter's? There's a lot of Peter's floating around. In, in. Have you seen a lot on service, Renee? Yeah, yeah. Peter's on, on Pete's, yeah, yeah. I see a lot of there's, Peter's. They have a large population of Peter's in our, in our population here. So a glaucoma, Terry, want to mention what a glaucoma looks like? Oh, is it like kind of like a corneal opacification? Yeah, but yeah. Remember, leuco means white. It's just basically a white spot on the cornea. And what does that white spot do to? Come on, guys. Hey, You're yeah, the first on. years. Come on, you know this, Chris. Yeah, what is it? Say malformation of the cornea. Almost, yeah. Almost. No, it is. It, it kind of is. It is. It, it, it was. It's a malformation, but the answers are given in the question here. Like, what happens? You're seeing what processes. What What's attached to what? In, in so it's, it's not it, just a white spot on the cornea. Yeah. It's usually a white spot on the cornea. It's just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. What's underneath it? You'll see variations. You'll see some that are very mild, and some that are extremely severe. So it's iridocorneal adhesions, or you can have lenticular corneal adhesions, and what the white spot you're seeing is the loss of uh, the endothelium decimates and some of the posterior stroma. Yeah, so remember that when you see a Peter's anomaly, you see that white spot, remember that's the tip of the iceberg. You have to look further. And often cases, we have to put these kids to sleep because we have to look and see exactly do they have a visually significant cataract? Is there complete um, abnormalities in the anterior segment? 
you got the iris that's just tacked up to the cornea. And even worse is if you've got the lens that basically is drawn up and is attached to the cornea. So those are very complex cases. You probably want to know that before going in for cataract surgery. Okay? <laughs> so good idea to put these kids to sleep, examine, you might need ultrasound. Uh, UVM may be helpful to be able to look at the entire anterior segment uh, and see exactly where the attachments are. So uh, now, remember I told you that for most of these anomalies and syndromes, what's the risk for glaucoma? 50%. 50%. So F is not the right answer. Um, you, the answer to this question is E, but F would be 50%. So the answers are actually E and F, right? I think, Terry, you just said E, right? Or Chris? Was it kind of just said E? Yeah, so. Question. The answer to this is actually uh, E and F, because it's about 50% risk for the Okay, number five. A parent with a one-year-old anoretic child presents to your office asking about the long-term risk of glaucoma. Which statements are not true about anoretic Nobody wants to go for it, so we're just going to go through these one by one. So, less than 50% risk of glaucoma? That is, is that true? It's probably 50%. 50%. So, 50 to 75%. Sorry, it's not 50%. So, I'm trying to basically create some generalizations for glaucoma, because you're going to see these patients in clinic, and the patients are going to ask you before they ask Dr. Hoffman. So, it's okay for you guys to hedge and say approximately 50%. And then Hoff will kind of take it from there, okay? Or Dries, or whoever you're working with. But most of these problems are about 50% risk, uh, or more. B, if glaucoma is not present at birth, there's no long term risk of glaucoma. Is that true? No. That's false, okay? There is always uh, a long term risk of glaucoma in patients who are anaerobic, and even in other types of glaucomas. The most common mechanism of glaucoma is maldevelopment of the ankle. Is that true? No. So what usually happens? Chris, go ahead. Well, the iris stump rotates forward to block the angle. Blocks the angle. Okay, that's one of the common things that you see. Now, I will tell you that we still consider doing angle surgery for some of these patients. Um, I think it just depends on when they present. And sometimes you can get away with angle surgery because angle surgery is thought to be helpful if what is not developed. What are you doing in angle surgery? You guys remember what we're typically doing? Either an agoniotomy or a trabeculotomy situation. What, they, what is it that we're cleaving? Are we cleaving the Schlumps canal? Are we cleaving the collector channels? In agoniotomy? Yeah. Yeah, you're going through. Yeah, you're going. Well, I know that in a trabeculotomy, you're cutting the Schlumps canal, right? Aren't you going through Schlumps canal yeah, yeah, and then stripping it? So. Let me be a little bit more precise here. So think about the normal pathway of aqueous outflow, and we typically think of what site as the area of highest resistance to <coughs> uh, TM, Schlumps Canal, Collector's Channels, or downstream? Where is the site of where we think there's most resistance? It's the juxtacanalicular. Which is part of the TM. 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 So when we're doing angle surgery, our thought process is if there's something wrong with the mesh one. So we're not actually cutting through Schlem's canal, and we're cutting into Schlem's canal, but if you cut the back wall of Schlem's canal, what are you now into? What structure? It's also white. It's yeah. Okay. So we don't make the cut so deep that we're going into splitter, creating spleral lakes. All we're doing is we're cutting the mesh work, and that basically is thought to break down the very highest resistance and water goes through the mesh work, through that cleft that we create, now accesses the Schlumps Canal into the collector channels. Does that make sense? So in anaerobics, we do do angle surgery. And that's because of, there, are some thought, there is some thought process that in some cases, depending on, depending on when they present, that the mesh work may actually be dysfunctional. So cutting the mesh work early on may be helpful in a patient with anaerobic glaucoma. But later, the stump may rotate into the mesh work. And unless you remove the stump, probably not going to effectively treat the glaucoma. Does that make sense? So just think, pediatric glaucoma, is, you've got all these weird syndromes and things to tuck away, but the surgery is quite simple in terms of what we're targeting, okay, in terms of angle surgery. Okay? 
All right. The most common mechanism of glaucoma is synechial angle closure. That's true, based on what Christy said. The iris stump is causing synechia rotating into the meshwork. So that means for that question, question five, the ones that are not true would be A and B. So I got a question about yeah. that. When you use that term, like just for semantics, it, the uh, synechia, I always think about synechia being like, PAS, you know, um, like from long-term closure, you have PAS kind of forming, but sure. So, but all all PAS comes from what? What, what eventually is pulled into the mesh It's usually iris. iris. Okay, whether it's uveated glaucoma, whether it's aniridia, you have a stump that's just pulling in. Yeah. It's rudimentary or mature iris tissue. Okay, the inflammation contract causes some contractile issues. Pulls the iris up into the angle. Okay. I keep thinking of like different mechanisms here. I keep thinking that the iris stump actually closing it off versus you know PAS actually forming. And I thought that this meant PAS forming. And well, I think so. I'm just I will, okay. So let me back up. I will in this question and, and in general when I use the term PAS, mm -hmm. whether the mechanism be aniridia or inflammation or neovascular glaucoma, I'm saying that the iris is clogging the meshwork. It's being pulled in, either being pushed in or pulled in. Okay. So like a neovascular glaucoma, you have that abnormal membrane that's laid down early on. And that membrane has to contract all forces and will actually pull the iris up into the mesh. Does that make sense? So you know when we think about neovascular glaucoma, we have these abnormal low blood vessels that clog the trabecular meshwork. But that's not ultimately what causes the damage, right? Because if you give them anti-VEGF, you get rid of all those low blood vessels. But long term, why do they these patients have terrible glaucoma, it's because of this abnormal membrane that pulls things in, and then they just zip up their angle with the iris. The iris just gets pulled up into the angle and zips up the entire angle, and then you can't see the meshwork at all, okay? So that's like a severe form of neovascular glaucoma. But I'm using the term PES to refer to synechia, PES, those terms to me are synonymous. So whatever the underlying mechanism is, the iris is being drawn up into the meshwork. Okay. And we're saying that C is also correct, uh, like or not, not a right answer, but um, actually it's about how the angle occurs. Yes, I'm sorry. So A, B, and C. The answers for five are A, B, and C. Now, what's, by by say, knowing that we talked about uh, C, though, remember that there is some thought process right. early on. Mm -hmm. There can be some malnutrition in the angle and the radio. But primarily, we think of synovial closure as the main mechanism. All right, question number six. An infant with Sturge presents with congenital glaucoma. Which of the following is not correct? A. A is not correct. And? We said C. C. That's not correct. So let me, let's read the question one more time because I put some clues in there. Patient with surge wedge present, presents with congenital glaucoma. So let's go through these. Elevated episcleral venous pressure is the likely mechanism of glaucoma in a surge patient that presents with congenital glaucoma. Is that true? So remember that the clue is congenital. Yeah, so that's congenital. not true. Yeah. It's not yeah. true. It's uh -huh. not true, okay? So we classically think of Sturge Weber as being elevated as he's low venous pressure, he's at a full blind state, et cetera. But the key here is that this patient presents with congenital glaucoma. So another generalization, very broad generalization. If you guys see a patient with congenital glaucoma, no matter what the cause is, let's say it's primary congenital glaucoma, it's aniridia, it's Sturge Weber, it's Axenfeld Readers, it's uh, anterior segment dysgenesis. What is the underlying mechanism for practically all of these congenital glaucomas? Maldevelopment of the angle, right? So dysgenesis. So just tuck that away as a generalization because I want you guys to kind of be able to simplify congenital glaucoma. There's a lot of syndromes out there. They present early on, 
That's why we're doing angle surgery, because we think there's just genesis of the angle. Okay? That's a very simple generalization that applies just about to every case. So A is not true. Glaucoma is more common when the nevus femius involves the upper eyelid. Is that true? That is true. Yes. Irido-trabecular dysgenesis is the likely mechanism of glaucoma. Yes. That is true. A glaucoma drainage device is preferred over angle surgery. Is that true? No. no. Why? Because of E. There's a high risk of choroidal fusions and coronal primary strain surgery. Okay? So the answers again are A, that is not true, and D is not true. We would still prefer to do angle surgery in a sturge weapon patient who presents with congenital glaucoma. Now this question is different. Let's say I said <coughs> a patient with sturge weber, an eight-year-old presented with glaucoma and high pressure, this would be different. Our mechanism would be elevated episcopal venous pressure. We probably angle surgery is not likely to be helpful, okay? It's because of elevated episcopal venous pressure. So do we currently have a way to bypass episcopal venous pressure? Or, I mean, is it, well, if you do a goniotomy in a patient with Stuart Weber with glaucoma six years old or eight years old, if you cut the trabecular meshwork, does that really get to the root of the problem? No, it's further downstream. Does that make sense? So when we cut the trabecular meshwork, that's something that's more proximal. It's not a downstream mechanism. So in order to get around this, you have to do a bypass. So you can do a trabeculectomy or you can do a glaucoma drainage device. I will tell you just my personal preference that doing trabeculectomies in kids is very difficult. Those of you that have managed some of our post-ops at the veterans know that's a challenge already, okay, <laughs> is managing patients, adult patients with uh, a fistula, but let alone a kid. You can imagine how difficult that is. You can't put somebody to sleep every week to manage a trap, okay? It's just not practical, and just uh, their exposure to general anesthesia would just be horrific. Every week, having to go through an EUA so you can manipulate the blood. It's just now. Well, does this happen around the world? Yes. Do they manipulate the blood? No. What they're, what they're hoping to do is tie those sutures just a little bit loose. And this is where kind of the art of glaucoma comes in. But it's a risky. It's a very. It, it's something that has not a lot of control to it. So you're either going to get patients that do well, or you're going to have patients with flat chambers the next day and you have to go back in and refill them. So for me personally, I don't do trabeculectomies in kids. It's just too difficult to manage. So most of these kids are going to get a tube shot if I need to do a bypass surgery. Okay? But this does happen around the world. And why? Primarily, probably, um, it has to do with economics, and it also has to do with supply chain. Okay? Most parts of the world don't have access to glaucoma drainage devices. They're, they're expensive. Although Aravin has made this a lot cheaper, they have created a mock-up of a bare belt tube. Um, it's mainly just for adults. I don't know if anybody's using it kids. Essentially, a device that they've gotten down, I think, just below $100, maybe $50 or $75 for uh, a knockoff of the barrel. Okay, seven. Which of the following is true regarding aphakia after a congenital cataract surgery? Okay, let's start with A. 15 to 50% of more development of glaucoma. Is that true? I'm going to go with true. True. Okay. Again, that 50% is thrown in there. Yes, there could be a low end, but this is why it's okay. I think if you just kind of tuck that away, if you see patients that are presenting uh, with glaucoma, you know, infants, uh, congenital patients, you can kind of hedge and say roughly 50%, but for certain cases, there's a range. Okay? Uh, but this is where the 50% rule comes in. B, the patient is only at risk for developing glaucoma within the first three years after surgery. Now let me back up and say this is aphakia after congenital cataract surgery, okay? So the patient presents with a uh, congenital cataract, you operate, they're not aphakic. Is there a certain risk window or are they always at risk of developing glaucoma? Always at risk. Always, okay? So this is false, B is false, okay? This is a lifetime risk. After they graduate from Hoffman and Dries practice, into the adult practice, and we follow these patients for the rest of their life, okay? Because of this lifetime risk. C, the mechanism of glaucoma is related to irido-trabecular dysgenesis. Now, think about this. This is a patient that had a normal presenting eye otherwise, had normal pressures, had just a congenital cataract, you remove the cataract. No. 
that's, that's not true. That's not true, okay? So usually what can happen after aphakia, uh, there's thought to be this roll between the lens, the zonules, and the ciliary processes. Um, when you don't have the lens inside of the eye anymore, you don't have as much stretch on the zonules. Uh, and then likewise, you may not have enough stretch on the sperm spur, and that may affect the opening of the trachea. So remember, you've got two sets of muscles that are attached to the skull spur. You have your circumferential muscles. I'm talking about the ciliary body muscles, okay? And then you've got your tangential fibers, right? There is that relationship. There's, a, there's an interplay between the lens zonules and the ciliary muscles. So you remember an angle recession, right? An angle recession, you get a splitting of those fibers between the circular fibers and the tangential fibers, okay? And by splitting that muscle, basically open up the ciliary body, okay? And so it, it's almost related in that same way, but not quite. Um, if you have a patient with traumatic glaucoma, with angle recession, right, and you get that splitting of the muscle fibers, there's thought to be um, contraction of the trabecular mesh work because those ciliary muscles can't maximally pull the swell spur, okay? So it's almost, it, although we're not splitting muscle fibers in a patient with general cataract, there is this interplay between the lens on those and ciliary processes and how they work together. Okay, so next part. So C is true. D, removal of all residual cortex during cataract surgery may reduce the occurrence of glaucoma. That's true. true. Yes, that is true. Small corneal diameter is a risk factor for development of glaucoma. I'm going to go with true. No. Um, yes. Cataract surgery in the first year of life is a risk factor for development of glaucoma. I'm going to say yes. Yes, that's true as well. Okay. Eight. Which of the following surgical techniques is the preferred method of treatment in a one year old? with PCG, primary congenital glaucoma, and cloudy corneas. B. B. Trabeculotomy. Okay, so Tara, do you remember the difference? Can you explain for the group what the difference between a goniotomy versus a trabeculotomy? They essentially do the same thing, but the approach is what you need to remember. So a goniotomy, it you know, requires clear cornea because you're like directly viewing the ankle structure. And then I think with trabeculotomy, it's like a, I guess you don't, don't doesn't require direct viewing because it's an indirect approach. So not quite a, there, I, I think both of them, you're talking about a view versus a, a direct view versus an indirect view, right? Or I guess a direct view versus like trabeculotomy, it's like at, or at There's a special word, is it at internal or at external, traditional, oh. or trabeculotomy? Yeah. At external. At external. Okay. So the way to remember this very easily. So what instrument do you need that's critical to perform a goniotomy during surgery? It's in the name. Gonioscope. Gonioscope. Okay. So those of you that have seen using a gonioscope or a goniotomy prism in surgery, you are using a microscope. You are tilting the patient's head away from you, putting the prism on the eye, and directly viewing through the microscope looking directly at the meshwork, okay? So, thus, if you're using something that is uh, allowing you direct view, it requires a relatively clear cornea, okay? If you don't have a clear cornea, doing a goniotomy is very difficult. Now, this comes, this is, these are things just for you to tuck away in terms of generalizations. If you need a clear cornea for goniotomy, for trabeculotomy, you don't, and that's because you're doing the surgery from the outside in, or at external. You take down the conjunctiva, you do your scleral dissection into Schlem's canal, and then you pass either a suture or a catheter, or a uh, Harms trabeculotome is another device that is really no longer used. It looks like a pitchfork. And basically, you slide the device into the angle, and then you pull it through the meshwork and cleave the meshwork, but you're doing that from an outside in approach. So it doesn't matter if the cornea is clear or not, because as long as you know your anatomy from the outside, remember, Water as it as it's coming through, trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal, the back wall of Schlem's canal. If you cut that, you now enter the sclera. 
So now you can do that whole dissection from the outside in. Take down the conch, cut the sclera, get into Schlem's canal, <coughs> pass your suture or your catheter around, and then do your cleavage. Okay? Now this has changed because now we have newer techniques. Some of you guys have seen the GAP procedure. Um, and the GAP <coughs> procedure allows me to do the surgery. I can do a full trabeculotomy now. Usually for the goniotomy, you're treating just the nasal angle. But now with the trabeculotomy at internal, I can do essentially the same surgery that was previously at external, and I can do it from the inside as long as I have a reasonably clear point. It, can't, it doesn't have to be exquisitely clear, but as long as it's reasonably clear for me to be able to make uh, the cut in the meshwork and then pass the suture and catheter around, you can do a full 360 degree trabeculotomy now at internal. But for your boards, for your questions, just remember that you need to have a clear cornea for goniotomy, because you're using gonia prism or gonia scope. On the virtual bicolotomy that's done at external. Okay, uh, nine. The parents of a six month old child with PCG want to know how successful angle surgery will be in their child. What is the appropriate response? A. A. 70 to 80 percent. And what do you guys remember that we already talked about in the previous question? What's that magic window where angle surgery seems to be a better prognosis? Three to twelve. Three to twelve. Okay. So if they present really, really early, you know, one month old with congenital glaucoma, that's not as good of a prognosis uh, versus someone who presents in that three to twelve month window. That's kind of the magic window for prognosis. And wrapped into that prognosis is this success with surgery. Okay. Ten. Uh, which of the following class of medications should be avoided in infants with glaucoma? Which was discovered by Norm Zabriski here, reported the case series. C. C, alpha adrenergics, that is correct. Uh, do we use myotics? Some of you guys that rotate their peds? Not really. Ever well, you can, but. You can. You can, but we don't usually. So I'll tell you the, the cases where myotics make the biggest difference it's a wonder drug for aphid or glaucoma. Okay? And what do myotics do? Constrict the pupil, but they're, what are they doing? They're pulling on <laughs> trabecular meshwork. So it actually increases aqueous outflow, right? That's the idea. So that's why it works so well in aphagic glaucoma. Because remember, we took out the lens of aphagic glaucoma. We don't have that stretch that we normally do, okay? And so by pharmacologically creating that stretch in aphagic glaucoma, myotics may be helpful. So you'll see it in a few of our patients. But we're looking at now when you're in the PED service. Look for the aphantic glaucoma patients that may be on phosphaline iodide. We rarely use it, but it is available, or pylocarpine. Um, but typically, if we're going to put somebody on long term uh, myotics, we're using phosphaline iodide. And in case you ever have to write the prescription, it's very rare, but it's 0.125%. Okay, VIT, dose VIT. All right, how about uh, CAIs? How about DIMOX? Do we use DIMOX for infants? Is that safe? Yes, yes. Yes. I mean, if someone's going to be on it for a while, it's probably a reasonable thing to check electrolytes and your normal things that you need to check for for patients that are on long term uh, CAIs. But we use them temporarily. Now, a common thing that you guys may get called on is that they're going to call you from Wyoming or Montana, somewhere, somewhere really far away, and they'll tell you this classic story of kids tearing, with thalamus, cloudy corneas. One thing that you guys can do in conjunction with you know, consulting with myself or Dr. Hoffman is placing the patient on Diamox before they get here to our, to our facility for an EUA. Why is that helpful? See. So we can see. We might have a chance to do angle surgery if you can clear the cornea ahead of time. Okay? So the dosage for this is 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram okay, per day, dose TID. Okay? So Dr. Hoffman likes to just say 12. He just says dose at 12 milligrams per kilogram. But the range is 10 to 15. Okay, so 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per day, and then divide that TRD. If you have to start somebody a pediatric trial on CAI diamonds. 11, you have decided to use a beta blocker in an eight month old PCG patient says what's going on in times two. Which of the following are important considerations? Okay, I'll start from the beginning. A, beta blockers are contraindicated in children younger than one year old. Is that true? That is not true. That is not true. 
is false. We still use them. B, nasal lacrimal duct occlusion can be helpful. Is that true? Yes. Yes? Yes. It's a good idea to tell your, your, your parents to do nasal lacrimal duct obstruction when they're using all block on drops with particularly beta blockers because there can be a lot of systemic absorption. 0.5% to mole is the preferred concentration. Is that true? You guys know what the normal concentration is that we have for adults, like in CoSoft or in Timol all straight? 0.5. That's the normal dosage. So for kids, you might want to back off and go to 0.25%. Okay? So that's not common. You guys are just used to writing Timol all, BID, CoSoft, BID, and you forget about the percentages. When you're working with kids, uh, if you're going to prescribe straight Timol, you cannot get dorsolamide Timol in a 0.25% concentration. Be aware of that, that when we typically prescribe COSOP, let's say we want to do combined therapy, it is 0.5% that's in COSOP, you know, the generic COSOP. Um, so um, if you're going to be prescribing straight to mole, though, try to use a 0.25%. Okay. D, should be avoided in patients with asthma or significant cardiac disease. Everybody knows that. That's true. Okay. 12, which of the following is not true regarding JOAD? Which of the following is not true? C and E. C and E, that is correct. So let's go through each one. Presents between the ages of 4 and 35. That's correct. Most are inherited as autosomal dominant. Correct. That's why family history is important. And if you notice in our clinic, next time you guys see patients with juvenile, ask the parents too. Uh, many cases you'll see that a parent had a juvenile and angle as well. C, the angle can appear dysgenic like in PCG. Is that true? That's not true. Okay? Remember, these kids present later in life, right? So their angle has been working fine, and then after the age of four, between four and 35, they suddenly get glaucoma. You should think of that as being just a miniature version of adult glaucoma. The mesh work is becoming dysfunctional. It's not dysgenic, it's dysfunctional. So the angle anatomy looks normal. Um, when we're operating on kids with PCG, the angle looks very, very maldeveloped. It looks very immature. You can't see landmarks, you can't see the mesh work, you can't see the scleral spur very well. All you see is a high iris root insertion, and then it almost looks like it's just corny. That's it. So remember for juvenile, they've had time to develop their angle. Now their angles are going to look normal, There's, it's just not working properly. Progressive myopia can continue to develop until 10 years of age. It's a little tricky. Is this true? It's not true because throughout their life, they can actually get myopia. They can progress, right? Because the yeah, yeah. So, so the answer. So you're saying that it is true that they can develop progressive myopia. Yeah, past the age of 10. Yeah. Yes. So the it's, so D is not one of the answers for this question, but that statement is true. Okay. Boot thalamus and hops are common. You see that in Joag patients? No. These kids look normal. There's really nothing wrong with them except maybe you're going to notice that they're becoming more myopic. Uh, and then you obviously check the pressure, look at the nerve, and it really looks cut and have classified as glaucoma. Okay, 13. True or false? The role of CCT is well established in pediatric glaucoma and should be routinely measured in all children with glaucoma. False. False. There's no pachymetry in Pete's body. That's your clue, okay? <laughs> Not just because it's hard, but even when we come and do e waves, we don't check the chemistry inside the OR. Uh, last question. The normal corneal diameter of a full term, full term newborn is which of the following? This is a tough question. Because I, there's a range. It's B. 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 10 is normal. So, what about at the age of 1? What should we expect the normal corneal diameter to be? Between 11 and 12. 11 and 12. Okay. All right. Some things about e waves, just real quickly, I know we've run out of time. Uh, in general, when we're doing e waves, we try to check the IOP as soon as we can because general anesthesia can do what to the IOP? It can lower it. So we try to, not always, I mean, the book tells you to try to do it immediately after intubation or after induction, try to get the pressure, uh, but that doesn't always happen. Okay? Um, What's a normal pressure for a newborn? You guys are going to be called to, the, to a service, and, and someone's going to tell you this, this patient has an eye problem. You go and check the pressure. 
assuming you've gotten a good examination without any squeezing, what should be kind of the normal pressure range for a newborn? Low teens. Low teens, okay? And then over their time, usually about middle childhood, the pressure will kind of go into that normal range that we talk about, 10 to 22. But newborn should have teens in the low pressure. Uh, one question I forgot to ask, neurofibromatosis. Um, you guys remember there's two types of, of neurofibromatosis. There's only one of them that's associated with glaucoma. Do you remember which one? NF1. NF1. And NF1 is on which chromosome? 17. 17. Do you know how do you remember that? That's what? 17 letters. 17 letters in one record house. Thanks. So that's how you remember some of those things. Uh, one more thing about anorrhea, because this always comes up. Um, you guys remember that most of the cases are autosomal dominant, but one third are sporadic. But this is where you can make a life or death diagnosis. What is associated with the sporadic? Wilms tumor. Wilms tumor. Okay, so it's important to get those patients screened and get a, spor a sporadic form of anorrhea. Uh, they need to get by, I don't know, the protocol, but usually it's like renal ultrasounds and yeah. checking for a Wilms tumor. Okay? All right, any questions? We've run out of time. Is that helpful? That's very yes. helpful. Thank okay. you. Just some, hopefully, some broad generalizations as you're rotating on service. Well, tuck away, don't forget the 50% rule. Don't forget that when kids present young, it's because of trabecular dysgenesis of any cause, anterior segment dysgenesis, Serge Weber, PCG, the mesh work is dysfunctional. Don't forget clear cornea that you need for goniotomy because you're using a gonial prism, you've got to look directly through. You can't do goniotomy unless the cornea is clear. Thank you. Thank you.